This is Mercer Bullard, director of the Business Law Institute at the University of Mississippi School of Law. This video is part of our Introduction to Accounting for Lawyers. It discusses the concept of par value in the context of the balance sheet. In our initial video, this is how we presented shareholders' equity. It shows the value of common stock. An actual balance sheet often looks quite different. Common stock is usually represented by two entries, par value and additional paid-in capital. This is the shareholders' equity section of the balance sheet for Facebook for December 31st, 2012 and June 30th, 2013. It was filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission on Form 10-Q, a quarterly report required under the securities laws to be filed by public companies. This section shows, how the, company, shows the company's common stock, and this line shows its retained earnings. We are interested in how the common stock is presented. Note that instead of a single entry for common stock, there are entries for par value common stock and additional paid in capital. In short, when a company issues common stock, the amount the company is paid is broken into two parts. The sum of par value and paid in capital equals the cumulative amount paid for the company's stock. As you can see, the total par value of Facebook's common stock is zero. It isn't actually zero, but rounds down to zero. The reason that Facebook's stock has such a low par value is that the par value for each share is only six ten thousandths of a cent. We can calculate the total par value of the shares by multiplying the number of outstanding shares by the par value per share. There are two classes of shares, Class A and Class B. There are about 3.5 billion outstanding Class A shares and about 1.3 billion outstanding Class B shares for a total of 4.8 billion shares outstanding. 4.8 billion times six ten thousandths of a cent equals $288,000. The values in the right-hand columns are expressed in millions, so $288,000 rounds down to zero. Let's insert par value of $288,000 into our equation. The value of paid in capital, as of June 30th, 2013, rounds out to $10.167 billion. We insert that amount in our equation, which gives us the total amount that shareholders paid for their shares, $10,167,288,000. The purpose of this video is not simply to explain how the amount that shareholders pay for their shares is divided between par value and paid in capital. Par value has actual legal significance. Facebook set the par value of its shares at six ten thousandths of a cent for a reason. In fact, it is very important for lawyers to understand that par value should generally be set at a nominal amount we're at zero in jurisdictions that allow zero par value. The consequences of setting a high par value can be disastrous. To understand why, it is necessary to review a bit of legal history. In the 19th century, par value referred to the actual value of assets contributed to a corporation in return for common stock. For example, if a shareholder contributed land worth $100,000 to the business, the par value of the stock issued to the shareholder would be $100,000. Creditors who reviewed the company's financial statements would see that the company had a $100,000 asset. They accordingly might be comfortable loaning the business $75,000 because it appeared to have far more than $75,000 in assets to cover the loan. This liability is shown on the balance sheet as bonds payable. The problem is that the value of assets contributed to the company was often inflated. In this example, the asset might be worth only $10,000 while the financial statements showed its value as $100,000. If the company became bankrupt and had spent all of its cash, there would be only the $10,000 piece of land available to the lender and any other creditors to satisfy their claims. They thought that there would be at least a $100,000 piece of land. The lender and other creditors would sue, claiming that they had been defrauded. They would argue that the apparent capitalization of the business was false, and they relied on it to their detriment. Courts would hold shareholders liable for the claimed value of the assets, or their par value. Thus, shareholders could be held liable for the assigned value of the assets they contributed to the business. This was, of course, problematic for investors. They were potentially subject to additional payments beyond their initial investment. They were exposed to a court's judgment 
as to whether they had inflated the value of assets contributed to the corporation. Over time, the value assigned to shares was delinked from its par value. Companies assigned a nominal par value to newly issued shares, with the difference between the par value and the claimed value being accounted for as additional paid-in capital, also referred to as paid-in capital in excess of par value. For example, a $100,000 investment made in return for 1,000 shares might appear on the balance sheet as having a par value of one penny per share, or a total of $10, and having additional paid-in capital value of $99,990. Some states allowed no par stock to be issued, in which case the balance sheet may show only one entry for common stock. In practice, the par value is set so low that the risk of the value of the assets contributed being less than their par value is negligible. However, if a high par value is used, the risk of liability is very real. Lawyers should also be aware that in some states, such as Delaware, there are impairment of capital provisions. This means that corporations organized in those states may not make distributions to shareholders or repurchase shares if the entity's total shareholders' equity would fall below the amount of its legal capital, which is another term for par value. Let's see how this works. You may want to pause the video at times in order to be sure that you followed the transactions that follow. This company has $175,000 in assets. If the land were sold for only $10,010, its assets would be reduced to $85,010. The retained earnings account would be negative to reflect the loss of $89,990. This is called an accumulated deficit, which you can think of as negative retained earnings. Between the paid-in capital and the accumulated deficit, there is $10,000 in shareholders' equity. There's another $10 in legal capital, bringing the total shareholders' equity to $10,010. The shareholders are looking at a significant loss. They might be tempted to distribute the company's cash to themselves before the bond comes due. However, the impairment of capital rule prohibits them from distributing more than $10,000, which is the remainder after netting the accumulated deficit and the paid-in capital. The rest of shareholders' equity is the $10 in legal capital. A $10,000 distribution would increase the accumulated deficit to $99,990, which completely offsets the $99,990 in paid-in capital. That leaves shareholders' equity of exactly $10. Its legal capital would not be impaired, that is, reduced below $10. However, if the company distributed $10,005, the accumulated deficit completely offsets the paid-in capital with $5 left over. This amount would impair the company's legal capital. The extra $5 distribution would be prohibited because the company's legal capital would be impaired. The company's assets must always equal at least the amount of its liabilities plus its legal capital. In this case, $75,000 and ten, plus the $10 in par capital. As you can see, this rule has little effect when the par value is only a nominal amount. In this case, it freezes only $10 in shareholders' equity. If the company made the mistake of assigning a high par value, the effect of the impairment of capital rule would be significant. Let's restore the company to health. It now has $185,000 in assets. Note that there is $109,990 in shareholders' equity other than its $10 in legal capital. That means the company could pay $100,990 in dividends without impairing its legal capital. The accumulated deficit and the paid-in capital cancel each other out, and after the distribution, the company would still have $10 in legal capital. However, if the company had issued shares with a par value of $100 per share, its legal capital would be $100,000 instead of $10. It would have very little room to make distributions without impairing its legal capital. Here, with only $10,000 in shareholders' equity, other than its now $100,000 in legal capital, it would not be able to distribute more than $10,000, the amount of its retained earnings, because any additional distribution would impair its legal capital. The final consideration that par value may affect is the corporation's franchise tax. 
States impose franchise taxes on corporations organized under their laws. This tax may be based on the par value of the corporation's stock, which is another reason to use a low par value. Our last topic involves terminology. Unfortunately, par value is not always referred to as par value. It may also be referred to as stated capital, or as mentioned earlier, legal capital. One way, to, one way to remember these terms is to think of par value's legal significance, or as representing what the corporation is stating its capital is worth. There's also another term for paid-in capital, which is capital surplus. You can remember this by thinking of it as the surplus above par value. To summarize, par value has legal significance because shareholders may be liable for property contributed to the corporation being worth the amount of par value. Par value, therefore, should only be a nominal amount. In no par value states, it is zero. Two other reasons to have a low par value are that some states prohibit payments to shareholders if they would result in impairment of the corporation's legal capital. And some states base the amount of their franchise tax on par value.